man. But that's not true because he didn't come by the seed of Adam. He came by way of a virgin birth through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're reminded in Colossians 1, 13 and 14, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. God is light. In him there isn't any darkness, but he came down as a man to rescue us from darkness because we're trapped in it. And then he brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus, there is no darkness at all. So he is able to rescue those that are in the darkness. You know, I saw something in this word and it's kind of silly, but it was powerful to me. Redemption, I broke it down. Just looking at the word itself, you can see it has the word red, empty on. Kind of silly, but the red <laughs> was emptied on you and me. Redemption, we were bought with his blood that he shed for us on the cross when he was so stretched out, like Kelly said, and now your sins are removed from you as far as the east is from the west. And that keeps going and going. There's no point of reference there, is there? He's removed them from you, doesn't remember them. He chooses not to. He remembers them no more. Ephesians 5, 8 reminds us that you were once darkness. You were darkness. You were dead in your sins and trespasses. We were in darkness, but now you are light. You are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Live out who you are in Christ now. You're light in the Lord. You were once in darkness, but now because of his death, because of his resurrection, he's given you new life. When you placed your faith in Christ, you were taken out and put in. And you were redeemed. Now we, we, we get the opportunity to live out this life to one another. Share the gospel with others that maybe haven't heard or maybe they're stumbling and they don't realize how powerful this message is to, to rescue them from uh, their slavery to sin or a sin trap, uh, you know, or to be able to forgive someone who, who has hurt you very deeply, right? We continue to look at the cross and see how we've been loved so deeply, how Jesus was wounded so deeply. And it, I'm not saying it makes it completely easy to go forgive, but that's the only way we can when we're focused so squarely on him who gave his life to us. And then we can extend because we know the extent of our own sin and how much we were forgiven. So we get to live as children of light and give hope to others. 1 John 2.10 says, anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. So that's what it means to live in the light, right? We love others. We've received such love and grace from God, and now we get the chance of living in the light by loving others and sharing with them this incredible message of hope, redemption, life change right now, a new heart right now, living in the light right now and even better as paul said you know he desired to go to be with christ which is better by far but for your sake he remained so whoever anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble first john 1 6 says if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Now, that's not a believer. Believers in Jesus Christ, they have fellowship with God. They, they live in the light. 
and they live out the truth, right? This is who we are now. This is our identity. So you can see there's a contrast. There's contrast that John is doing here throughout this book. Maybe you can picture somebody claiming to have fellowship with God and yet walking in the darkness, or maybe you know of someone now. I'm not saying we look them and put them down and pick them out and point them out. No, but you just hear. You hear of them, and, and maybe that's an opportunity for us to go share the gospel with them, to pray for them, to wait for an opportunity, not to kick the door in of their life, but pray and wait for an opportunity to minister the gospel to them. And what is the result here? The result is if we claim to have fellowship with God and walk in the darkness, we can't live out the truth because the truth isn't in them. But notice the contrast that comes by believing in Jesus and having fellowship with God. We tell the truth about God's Son. And then we get to walk in the light and love others and live out who we are in Christ, this new creation. You know, that was my life before. I used to claim to have fellowship with God but walked in darkness. All various sins controlled me, anger, rage, impurity, disrespecting my wife, adultery. Oh, I claimed... I claimed to have fellowship with God, but my life was an absolute mess. There was zero change. I had some knowledge of the Bible, but no transformation and new heart. And, and that's what's most important is seeing the gospel. We can, have, we can know the Bible forward and backwards, but if we miss the gospel, we've missed it all. Amen. We have nothing, we have nothing. The gospel is the power of God. The gospel is where God's power resides, and therefore it's the message that Satan wants to blind to unbelievers. And we see this in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. It says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, the light of the gospel. He's blinded the minds of unbelievers so they can't see the light of the gospel that displays the glory, the, the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So now, friends, we, we, we have the privilege of knowing this and then taking the message out to the world, those who are hurting, those who need a Savior, as my wife always said about me. She never left me, which she should have, that's the counsel I would give today for a time, right? You can't live in that type of abuse. There ha something has to change. But you know what my wife did? She would always say, my husband needs a savior. Amen. Thank you. And so she prayed for me night and day, yes. literally. <laughs> and how thankful I am today to be able to stand here and deliver the message that saved me, delivered the message that freed me, delivered the message that where I was crucified with Christ, Amen. buried in a tomb, and yes. rose with him to yes. live a new life. Amen. And now our marriage is strong and powerful and finally loving. Now I know what love is. Never really knew it, never understood it. But in Christ, we see it. In Christ, we get to experience it. And then we get to experience it with one another comforting our brothers and sisters, loving them. But here in 1 John 1, 7, we see the cleansing that believers have in the gospel as we walk through these contrasts together. We'll see them. Verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from most sin. Some sin, very little sin, all, all sin, all sin. The blood of Jesus is this continuous fountain of cleansing for believers. Isn't that awesome? 
Now, when you confessed, when you agreed with God initially, yes, Jesus is the Christ. He died in my place. You were forgiven and given new life. Past, present, and future sins. This is, the gospel is too good. <laughs> it seems too good to be true, but it is. So we look to the cross and we, don't, we just agree with God. Yeah, we sinned. And we're thankful for the gospel. We're thankful for the cleansing. We're thankful for Jesus who forgave our every sin. Some Christians get stuck or trapped in, I got to confess every little itty bitty tiny sin that I ever do. And we just need to look and be thankful. Look and say, yeah, we, we knew it was sin. And we knew this was why Jesus came. That's the power of the blood to forgive past, present, and future sins. Because it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. We needed something to take our sin away completely. We needed Jesus. We needed the perfect offering. We needed the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God to do it for us. Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by one sacrifice, Jesus, he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life. handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You see how precious Christ is to Peter as he writes here. He could have just said with the blood of Christ, uh, with, the precious, with the precious blood of Christ, you were redeemed. How amazing is that? How incredible a message. He's without blemish or defect. He is without darkness. He is light. And he came to rescue us out, out of our darkness. Jesus was the lamb slaughtered in the fountain that was opened for us in Zechariah 13. The only child they will look at in whom they have pierced. We see this in Zechariah, the, the forecast of Jesus coming. Zechariah, the very next chapter, just, just a few verses from the end of chapter 12, it goes into, on that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants, have inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. O oh, victory in Jesus, he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Oh, he loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Thank you, Lord. He was drowned on the cross in his own blood so that he could rescue, out of, rescue us out of sin and darkness. No more shame, no more guilt, no more condemnation. Jesus took it all. He was condemned and you were set free. Isaiah said, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned. Hope is here. The rescue mission has begun at the cross. <laughs> so if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with God and then we have fellowship with other believers and the blood of Jesus is the fountain that purifies us from all sin. You see, John 1, 8 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. See, this isn't a believer. Here comes the contrast. A believer does not deny, doesn't claim to be without sin. Right? Because then you couldn't believe that Jesus went on a cross to die for your sin. So those that say or claim to be without sin are deceived. And now again, we have the privilege of sharing the message of hope with them. The message of the cross that can save them. 
You see, if we claim to be without sin, everything I just said about Jesus and his suffering on the cross for us uh, wouldn't pertain to you. Well, maybe someone is here today that I haven't sinned. I'm a good person. God's going to accept me for who I am. I'm a good person, and that's, that's going to get me to heaven. I'm a good person, and God's going to recognize that. No. No. It's not true. That's living deceived. And John here wants them to come to Christ. John wants them to come into the fellowship so they can, their joy can be complete as they celebrate the gospel together. All believers in Christ recognize sin as well as the cross which cleanses them, the blood of Jesus that purifies and washes them. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But brothers and sisters, we have the truth. You believe in Jesus Christ, died for your sins. Yes. You have the truth in you. Yes, sir. So this isn't you. Believers aren't bouncing in and out of light and darkness, Amen. in and out of fellowship and out of, in back and forth. No, we're stable. Amen. We're stable and anchored in the gospel. It's the anchor for our soul. It's solid ground upon which we can stand. And we believe and hold on to the promises of God not our crazy thinking sometimes where we might feel distant and we can say no the blood of jesus drew you near oh thank you <laughs> thanks for reminding me see believers still sin but we rejoice in knowing that jesus became sin entered into the darkness by becoming sin so that he could so that we could live in him and live in his light so John is pleading with them here. Don't say that you have no sin. Confess it. And God will cleanse you and forgive you of, of all sin. John said in 2 John 1, 1 and 2, the elder to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. You see, those that claim to be without sin don't have the truth in them. The believer has the truth forever. We have these promises forever. I got ahead of myself there a little bit. I often do that. Sometimes I get lost. I go out and I come back. Where was I? So it's impossible to be a believer in Jesus and at the same time claim to be without sin. You know, as I said, how can we believe that Jesus became sin if we do not believe in sin? Every believer has the truth in them. And remember, John's appealing. He's appealing to them. He's proclaiming, evangelizing, and correcting. So it's very helpful to know that this is what John is doing here. He's pleading with them to confess. Just agree with God. Agree with God that you have sinned. And that's, that's all you have to do. Just agree with God. He's the one that said that sin exists, and he's the one that sent the antidote of his son. Just believe God. Agree with him. I mean, it's incredible. Why wouldn't you want to anyway? You live a new life free from all this heavy weight of condemnation pressing you down, or, or like my life, or the hiding. I had to hide all the time who I really was. It was terrible. It was awful. And I was a fake, you know, my wife didn't even know me. Well, that's not, it's not a life to live, it's miserable. But it's freeing to live under that 
cleansing flood, the wounds of Jesus that heals us, the new life that he gives us. So that's what John's saying. John is saying if we confess our sins, now he's talking to the people that are denying and deceived in 1 John 1, 9. A lot of Christians think that 1 John 1, 9 is for them, but it's, we can see the contrast back and forth. It's for those that are denying that they have sin, the ones that are deceived. He's saying to them, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Just confess, believe, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ so we can have fellowship with you Amen. Amen. like we do here at the Gospel Church. Yes, He's saying stop claiming to be without sin, sin and simply agree with God. And verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, here we go again, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar and his word is not in us. So the contrast is the truth isn't in us if, if you deny that you have sinned or the word is not in us. But believers have the truth and his word in us, sealed with the Holy Spirit, Amen. never to be taken away. Who can break the seal of the Holy Spirit that God's given us? We're safe and secure forever. We're loved and adored by God forever. Amen. <laughs> so simply agree with God that you've sinned, which all believers have done. Let's not make him, him out to be a liar. No way. No way. He is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, yes, right? He, he is light. He is love, and he proved it by sending Jesus to be an atoning sacrifice for sins. Willingly, out of love for you, Jesus went into the darkness and suffered, died to bring you into his life, to walk in his light. He loves you. And he proves it over and over and over again to us in the scriptures. 1 John 2, 1 and 2 is the first time that he addresses. It's clear who he's addressing now. 1 John 2, 1 and 2, my dear children. My dear children. I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Amen. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. For those that are now claiming to be without sin, for those deceived thinking that they have no sin, we can take this message and hope that they believe it and receive it into their hearts and live a new life. In God's courtroom, we see a cross, the wood, the nails, and the offering. That's God's courtroom. We see no one there to accuse us, only one to pardon us. Jesus being pierced and we being pardoned. Jesus being crushed and we being made whole. Jesus being judged and we being justified. Amen. Jesus was condemned to death so we could receive his life. Yes, Lord. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That's the God we serve. That's the God who rescued us. That's the God who sent his son to be our advocate, to be our perfect offering, 
to give us a hope that the world knows nothing about, to give us life that we have the privilege of sharing together and with others. So let's walk in this light, walk in this love, and live it out to one another. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so incredibly thankful that you have rescued us, that you have loved us when we were enemies. Lord, even that teaches us how we can love our enemies, that you loved us when we were your enemy. But then you sent Jesus to die on the cross, to bleed out of his wounds for us, so that we might be children of light, that we might be crucified with Christ and receive a new life. And we have the privilege of sharing this message with others, encouraging other believers with this message so that we might all grow together as part of the body of Christ, be matured together, and then sharing it to a lost and dying world who had not yet received this powerful message of the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we pray that, Lord, as we live it out, we would share it with others out of love that we've received from you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and uh, the worship team can come back up.